Uh, I really do appreciate you stopping by and hearing from. We have some really uh, knowledgeable panelists here that um, are going to be able to share a lot of different information with you. Um, I wanted to feature several different ways that people in different professions, different parts of professions, communicate about science either to the public or uh, to people other than scientists in their own field, right? Because you can be a biologist or another kind of scientist, but maybe you don't know how to describe uh, something to a physicist. So I thought it would be good to, to get a group together and, and talk a little bit about the similarities and the differences. Uh, my name is Dina Farrell, and I'm Senior Assistant Director of Marketing Communications in the College of Science here at Notre Dame. And I'm also a term teaching assistant professor for science communications here at Notre Dame. And then I'm a lecturer for the Johns Hopkins University Master of uh, Arts in Science Writing program as well. So today I'm serving in the capacity of moderator, but uh, also if you have any kinds of questions about institutional communications, I can answer those for you as well. Um, today we have, we have our panelists. So we have Sandeep Ravindran right here. And uh, they're all going to share a little bit about themselves, but I'll just give a brief introduction. So he is a freelance science journalist for publications such as The New York Times, Wired, National Geographic, several others. And he also serves as vice president of the National Association of Science Writers. We have Tracy kajuski Correa. I'm that end. And she's the William J. Pulte Director of the Notre Dame Pulte Institute for Global Development. She's also a professor of engineering and global affairs. And she's the academic director for the Keough School Integration Lab. So thank you. Uh, Jill Pentamonti, next to her. She's the Director of Research Advancement at Notre Dame out in um, Washington, D.C. office. So we're, we're uh, there are camp, not campuses, but we have offices in different locations other than just here in South Bend. Heather Boyd, next to her, she is the Research Development Program Director here at Notre Dame. And finally, last but not least, Joe Ditz. He's the outdoors nature, writing, nature writer and reporter for the South Bend Tribune. So I will uh, let each panelist kind of start with a little introduction about themselves and what they do with regard to science communications. So I think I'll start with uh, Sandeep first, and we'll go down that way. Thanks, Dina. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, I'm Sandeep Ravindran. I'm a freelance science journalist. I actually started on the science side of things uh, and did a, you know, was doing a PhD in microbiology and immunology before I realized I liked writing about science more than actually doing it. Uh, and so I made the jump into science writing. And I freelance. I've been doing that for the past 10 years. And I write about uh, broadly life sciences and tech. I've tried very hard to sort of narrow it down over the past 10 years, 10 plus years. But uh, <laughs> that's about as um, narrow as I've been able to get it to. So I cover uh, you know, anything that interests me within that sort of broad area. Yeah, so I'm Joe Ditz. Um, so today I was in federal court covering a, a story. Um, and last Friday I was uh, covering a, a Supreme Court Justice uh, Kagan, who was at Notre Dame talking. I was at home watching and then writing a story. And then tomorrow I am, uh, oh, I'm going to be checking on what happened at the, the, the county council meeting tonight. Um, but then, oh, a couple of weeks ago I was, I have a, story about how um, city parks are maintaining the habitat on native habitat plants along the St. Joseph River. So in between doing all these news stories, I'm also writing about nature. So I've got a column in the South Bend Tribune that every Wednesday in print, Tuesday online, but about hiking, biking, paddling, and skiing, and along with that, writing about nature. So. Um, <laughs> I've written about a number of uh, interesting, so it's, it's a mix of things. I mean, it, I've been at the Tribune for more than 30 years, and I've written about everything, literally everything except for ball sports or sports on the sports page, uh, even fashion stories back in the day. So, um, 
<laughs> but through, through my own persistence, interest, you know, I got this outdoor column going. And so, well, I, earlier this winter, I was writing about crows, but because we were seeing these massive numbers, thousands of crows coming through the downtown. They do, they go through different parts of town every winter, but they were coming through the downtown, so it was becoming more of a noticeable thing. So I thought, oh, well, this is a way that I can relate nature to people. I like to find those things that are kind of every day we can all connect to them. So that was pretty fascinating. That was, that was pretty well read because yeah, everybody's seeing the crows and thinking Alfred Hitchcock and like, no, 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 no. They're really, this is a matter of them trying to survive. Um, it was a survival. So um, I've, uh, six years ago, I wrote uh, Barbara Hellenthal. She's the curator of the herbarium. Yeah, she's still here. Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, I got with her, and she took me for a little tour of the campus and some interesting pockets of nature and interesting trees and, and things like that. So that was a, that was a really fun one to, to write about. Um, again, in a very popular place, the campus. Um, and, and there's a hitching post from like a hundred years ago. It's still embedded in a northern white pine tree. Um, but uh, I've written a lot about the, the eagle's nest at St. Patrick's County Park that, um, as you probably all know, the N Notre Dame has an eagle cam trained on the, on the eagle's nest, very popular. So I've tracked that and the appearance of these eagles over the years. Um, and so that's, that's been fun, including one where Notre Dame researchers were counting up how many different kinds of species of of food that they were getting. It turns out that, that the eagles really like sushi, raw fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, um, oh shoot, and there was you know, Father Newland. Uh, you all know about Father Newland here on campus. Well, there's a bog where he, he'd found this plant, a certain kind of plant um, in our area. And present day, there's a botanist who was looking for that plant. And so he went looking in that area not realizing that, that there's actually a bog there, but that led that botanist to discover that, that bog, or, or rediscover it. Um, and now it's called Lydic Bog, and it's a very popular nature preserve for people to go hike. And so I've, I followed that progression, um, and that botanist is now the, the state botanist for Indiana. Um, so every once in a while I may text him for a question <laughs> about a plant. Um, but there's a, a whole litany of, of various um, things. In, in the springtime, I, I write about uh, wildflowers. So if you're one of the people who's here for only four years or short time, you need to go to Bendix Woods County Park. It is late April or early May. It's a showstopper. They've got the, the, the largest concentration here locally of uh, great white trillions. There's thousands and thousands. It's a fairy tale land. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so there's so many more things I, I could share, but um, I don't want to hog up the time. Right. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Heather. Thank you. Hi, my name's Heather Boyd, and I work in research development here at Notre Dame. And like the title says, we work with physical scientists and social scientists to help them grow their research and education programs. And part of that is helping to support them in writing the best proposals they can write to funding agencies and sponsors. So there's no secret, there's science in those proposals. And the people who review those proposals know the science. But in addition to that, a lot of those proposals have supplemental documents that have to do with things like outreach, engagement, diversity, inclusion, human subjects, data management, all of those things have literature that backs them up. And so one role that my team and I play is to remind people there's a raft of literature on what works here. <laughs> Let's use it. Let's use the references to try to convince the reviewers that we know what we're doing and we're using the work that people have had peer reviewed or the things that are in progress or in process. So. In my job, we use science every day, but in generally in that form. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Jill Penamani. As Deanna mentioned, I'm out in our DC office. Um, and a large part of my role there is a lot about communicating science. And some of it's very, you know, 
specific and with specific faculty that are here at Notre Dame. My job is to help stakeholders in DC really understand all of the wonderful things happening on campus. Um, and that can look like policymakers, so members of Congress and their staff, federal funding agencies, NIH, NSF, the like, um, because especially, you know, if we can have you know people in DC understanding the expertise we have on campus and it could possibly shape funding opportunities it could shape policy you know that's our end goal and really a wonderful sort of focus of communicating better science another part of my job sort of a larger role less specific and more general that I take part in with other colleagues like myself at other universities is helping communicate about the importance of science in general and the importance of funding basic research for example. Um, so we belong to advocacy agencies, places called like the Science Coalition, where we really talk about why is science important, and we do that at a larger level as well. So um, those are two parts of my role that I think really focus on what we're talking about tonight. Um, and then the other part of my job is I'm a researcher myself, which I think really helps as I'm talking to faculty and I'm thinking about communicating about science, because I truly understand the benefit but I think mostly I understand the challenge <laughs> and that I could do a much better job myself. And I understand how it is hard to take a full study where you've written a 30 page manuscript or you've done this for five years and distill it down into a couple of talking points for a staff and a member of Congress's office, right? That's very challenging and I understand that, but I also sort of see the other side and the benefit. So it really helps to to work in communicating both on the with to the policymaker and to the faculty <laughs> to have that perspective. Um, so it's a little bit about my role. Thanks. Uh, hi again. I'm I'm Tracy. I represent probably the only person on the panel who is just a, a science producer, um, but. I think um, I can offer some perspectives on why we need help with the last mile translation to actually get that work out in the world. So by way of context of the kind of work I do, um, as a researcher that works on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, I'm in frontline communities when disasters strike to help with the documentation of what has happened, more importantly, to, dis to basically accelerate the learning of why we see these catastrophic failures and losses of life all over the world, particularly from the climate-driven disasters at an accelerating pace. In short, if we don't get our message out about what hasn't worked in a community and how we need to rebuild in a more durable and sustainable way, lives are lost. So I have a real vested interest in science communication, because if it doesn't get back to the public, people literally on front lines will lose their lives. And what we found in the years of working on this problem is we have a lot of technical information and no one in the public listens. I will repeat, no one in the public listens. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, we recognize that humans acting on scientific knowledge, that behavior change and that uptake of that knowledge into action is a lot more than just the quality of the science. It has a lot to do with all the things outside of science that we don't control. So that was my first impetus to actually move to the Keough School and start working with policymakers and social scientists to understand that way that we could drive behavior change with scientific knowledge. But second, we're miserable communicating to the public for exactly the points that you made. And I would argue that, you know, we were asked to think about the role of media in my work. Media is actually my essential partner in my work at three points in what we call the disaster data to knowledge life cycle. When a disaster strikes and I'm ready to send my team, I organize teams from across the world to go into the worst events in our history. I actually need what media has reported in the first 24 hours to guide how I mobilize my teams in addition to the intel we're getting from agencies and other actors on the ground. But we actually mine, using natural language processing, all of the social and you know, media sources we can find to steer our efforts. Secondly, the immediate findings that are starting to emerge, we actually have journalists in bed with our teams so they can start telling the story on the front line as we direct them technically to where the, the science is happening and they find the human stories attached to it. And in that beautiful moment when a journalist is next to a researcher, that's when you learn about that behavior change moment of why that household didn't evacuate, for example, because that journalist can get that story out in a way that I couldn't as I'm doing the technical assessment. And then third, there are platforms for getting the word out after the study. My phone lights up a lot in hurricane season to explain what's happened or after any major disaster, but this is my primary channel to reach those communities so that our work isn't extractive. 
we're just taking from the community their hardship, their, their trauma, and their failure, but we're actually generatively bringing back what we could learn from that disaster to guide how they re rebuild and recover. So that's a key part of our loop. I will summarize, though, why I want you to have sympathy on a scientist, in my, in my case, in these engineers, because that's technically what I am. There's three reasons we are really bad at helping drive science communication. Number one, it is not our natural strength. Mm -hmm. My natural strength is in the sciences. I happen to be a journalist all through high school. I was the editor of my school paper, so I'm a unicorn with respect to science communication. But many of my colleagues are not. They're just amazingly gifted at the science, and that develops very different communication skill sets, sometimes no communication skill sets. And if you walked around an engineering building, you can see my point. And I can say that, right, because I'm one of them. Um, but a lot of my colleagues are even on the spectrum, autistically. It's hard for them to communicate to humans, but they can do some awesome math. And so that's just a natural gap we have. Number two, it's also not our learned strengths. Like you said, we're raised in an environment to write long papers and dissertations and to save the headline to the end in the conclusion and findings, rather than leading with the lead and the headline. And that's a tough skill to work out of us because we've been programmed to do it from day one and reward it as such. So we don't know how to get it to five bullets. Or when I teach policy communication to my students now in graduate school, how to get that to a, a lawmaker and get that done in an elevator, right? And so that's been really challenging to break the habits. But the third thing, and I don't know if most people know this in the room, we've now realized as a country that our science is not primed for sharing. So that means that a lot of federal agencies have actually tried to change the way we do, quote, research translation, recognizing it's not just research translation like new tech that becomes a patent, but communication is another form of translation. And so some of the agencies that we're working with, and I'm even running curricula on this now, we're actually training researchers how to bring stakeholders in at day zero, not at the end of the project when you're trying to force the findings down their throat, but at the first day of the project to say, what evidence do you need to drive change? And what are the pathways to get that to you? And then actually having those stakeholders engaged throughout the research to make sure we're lining up our findings correctly and our messages so when the work is done, it can translate in the way we envision, rather than forcing it at the end and like I did for 20 years of my life, wondering why no one listens. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for that. that I think I, what I've appreciated about this group here is that they have so many different specialties, but it all really goes back to how can we engage with the public to make sure that, one, that people understand the science, two, that it doesn't get completely watered down, which is different than it used to be back when there were only newspapers, three TV stations, et cetera. We have so much social media, that's tricky. And then um, also that it's kind of a team effort, right? Because you've got journalists, you've got researchers, you've got folks in between, institutions, uh, public information officers, all of these folks, who I think all are acting generally for the same good, you know, trained journalists who are wanting to get the science out, and it's so difficult. So I think, um, you know, I, I think that kind of leads into my first question, and I, I'll direct it to, to Sandeep. You were a scientist, so what made you kind of take a turn and say, you know, I really want it, I would really rather write about this and communicate it than sit in, in a lab and do it? Yeah, no, I, I think um, for me personally, I mean, I was always interested in, in both science and writing. Um, I just didn't realize that there was such a thing as science writing. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought you had to pick, you know, I thought it was this sort of, you have to pick science or writing. So actually, um, you know, I did my undergraduate, I was a bio major, you know, so I did science throughout my undergraduate. And then right at the end, I realized I still loved writing. And so when I was applying to, um, you know, PhD programs in science, I actually simultaneously applied to MFA programs in creative writing because, again, I didn't realize science writing was an option. Um, and so I, you know, continued, I wasn't done with science yet, I continued in, in, you know, doing my PhD, and then right as I was about to uh, finish up, maybe like a year or so before, I attended a talk on actually a panel like this where I heard from a science writer, and it just clicked, like, oh, I could, do, you know, I like science, I like writing, I should do science writing. 
Um, and you know, it really comes down to wanting to, you know, as, as many of my panelists, uh, fellow panelists have said, I mean, wanting to communicate sort of complex science to the general public. You know, I think um, there's, you know, I love science. I, there's so much cool science going on, but it's, it doesn't always, you know, like get get to the the general public. Like, it, you know, doesn't, and so that's kind of where I fit in. Is I like taking, you know, the, the sort of complex scientific um, things, and and especially in this day and age, you know, that covers so many things that are directly relevant to, you know, like everyone's sort of everyday life, and taking that and finding a way to sort of translate that in a way that makes sense to to everyone. Thank you. Uh, Heather, I was thinking when you were describing um, working on proposals for scientists to get grants and different things, could you share what that process is and then also share what you've noticed are the biggest sticking points? So for people who are scientists right now, what can they work on to make that process smoother for themselves? Wow. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Uh, there are lots of different processes for um, pitching your funding proposal to an agency that might want to fund it. And one thing that we find that a lot of our scientists, including social scientists, forget is that they can pick up the phone and call someone at that agency and have a conversation voice to voice. Because as Tracy pointed out earlier, you get rewarded for certain things when you've been at school for so long and you're used to text and you're used to people being critical about small things in your text, maybe not so much big things. And so it's just kind of a routine. You just start with the solicitation, look at it when people remember to read the whole solicitation. Um, and you go from there rather than thinking more broadly about, oh, what does this sponsor want? How do my goals align with this sponsor? Sometimes scientists will come with their own project and just, because they love it so much, assume everyone wants to fund it. And it can often be a mismatch between their passion and what the agency actually wants. And I, I'm glad we're talking a bit about translation today, too. Some agencies are more about translation, some agencies are less about translation. And depending upon where a scientist learned their science and in what setting. For example, if they did a lot of basic research versus maybe they worked at a land-grant university, not that they're mutually exclusive, a land-grant university has a more developed outreach arm to different audiences and brings in more diverse voices than maybe folks who are just in a lab. I say just, please. I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> um, so that those are some things that we notice. But another thing that we notice is that Scientists, and so I'm including social scientists, of course, um, sometimes they think they're just talking to themselves and their own peers. But in these review committees, yes, there are going to be people who know your science, but not know you necessarily. If they do know you well, they shouldn't be on their review, but that's a whole <laughs> talking federal agencies. But there are also going to be people with other expertise, like program evaluation, for example, of uh, things that I mentioned earlier today, where they won't know your science, but they'll be able to talk about how they would measure whether or not your science is successful. So they need to think more broadly about satisfying broader group, even in one proposal. Sorry, I talked too much, but thanks for no, asking me. No, it was kind of a complex question, but I figured you run into this, you know, you're starting with this document, and do you call the scientist on the phone and say, hey, do you work back and forth, or how does oh, that process excellent, work too? excellent. So I'm lucky in that I work with a range of people, including people who are independent contractors who have done this kind of work. And Jill has worked very closely with them too, Tracy knows them too. Um, and in our audience, I have a very talented colleague too, Dr. Sigmund. And they will look at the solicitation, but then do an iterative process mm -hmm. with the either the team or the individual or both and say, okay, you missed this part from the solicitation. I need you to hit that harder, depending upon how much time there is. Here's an example of something that was awarded. See how they did it. Not to say that that's exactly how you should do it, but here's an example. So ideally it's iterative, it builds over time, and you have a long runway. Yeah. In reality, sometimes we only have a few weeks 
to give some brief feedback to people. And we let them know the more time you give us, typically the better we can do for you. So it is, it is complicated sometimes. Yeah. And you've touched on it, so I'm going to ask Jill, um, when communicating with policymakers about science, what are some best practices? Yeah, it, it, it's, I'm glad that you said all of that you said, too, because a lot of it is just best communication practices. When you talk about alignment and thinking about you know, how you need to represent yourself, um, the first thing I'll talk about is alignment, because a policymaker and their staff has a lot on their plate. You know, often the staff members that you're typically talking to cover 12, 13, 15 issues. <laughs> you know, the issue that you're coming to talk to them about is just one of many, right? And so you have to think about where in their day do you fit in? Not coming with your agenda, but thinking about how you fit into their agenda is going to make you successful in communicating. Um, so what's important uh, legislatively then? Are there, is what you're talking about going to impact them that day when they write up a brief for their boss on something that their boss should be doing? And thinking about sort of where you fit into what is really relevant and current in a policymaker's brain is going to be incredibly important. I'll give a really specific example right now, and you probably know this, we are hearing a lot about AI on the Hill. And part of that reason is Senator Schumer and Senator Young from Indiana are setting up briefings around AI with the idea being the, you know, the, the members of Congress can't pull together regulation on AI unless they know what they're talking about. And the majority of Congress doesn't <laughs> know what they're talking about. You know, and that's great. I'm glad this is being realized. So we at Notre Dame, especially with Senator Young being the senator from our state, knowing him and his staff well, have been working really hard in our office to help him understand and his staff understand what expertise Notre Dame could bring to those forums and to those briefings, right? And so that we might have a space to impact policy. And for those reasons, you got to you know, take those experiences and sort of capitalize on what's being talked about and what's important. That's just sort of one example of how to do it. So I think alignment is huge for that. And then we, we touched on this briefly too, but being brief, being succinct, like you said, not putting the conclusion down at the end, but starting with that, um, that is very challenging. Uh, and that's what, you know, one page is about all you got. <laughs> and you're talking to the policymaker. A couple of bullet points and having conversations literally in an elevator are the kinds of things that might happen. So I think both of those sort of alignment and brevity and sort of leading with what's most important, what might both be most important that person you're talking to is going to be really key when you're thinking about communication communicating with a policymaker. Yeah, so. that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, since you, you work with experienced naturalists, you get to know them, um, they add to their knowledge as they go, right? But if you're a naturalist, you're constantly learning, constantly changing and adjusting. And what kind of suggestions do you have for people in science communications to learn and grow in the field? And maybe how have you done it over the years since you wear a lot of hats? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I. I guess I'm, I'm coming at this as a, as a reporter that I've been in journalism, so I'm used to you know, covering all these different stories and, and just taking whatever complex situation, just relating it to people. So it becomes whatever the complex situation is, it's like in terminology. So whether you're in the courts or you're in the city council, they, they use terminology, you're like, oh, wait a minute, if I don't get that at first blush, how's the reader going to understand it? So being, you know, wanting to be a good writer, I look for you know, words that I can use that people relate to. Um, but So I've been doing that for a number of years, and then when I d decided to get into to being an outdoors writer, yeah, it was a matter of, then I, I had to start learning you know, nature and things, so I started picking up guidebooks and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but. Uh, I, I think a lot, lot of it is I'm learning as I'm going along from the people. And if, if they're saying something that's a little bit over my head or a little complicated, or what does that mean? I'm not afraid to stop and say, what, is it, what do you mean by that? And, and usually the expert is, since they've got an audience with you, they're like, oh, okay. they're glad to accommodate you and explain that. And that's just, I'm breaking it down for the, the common folks. And then along the side, like I said, I use my guidebooks because I don't know all the plants and <laughs> birds and all that stuff. I'm always looking stuff up, and it's cool. I'm, I'm into it, so I'm, I'm keeping
keep these books by my chair at night. I'm like, like what did I just see today? So I think it's just having a habit of, if you've got a passion for something, let that really be a passion. Just keep, keep growing that. Just keep, keep digging into that and letting that foster in your life. And I think that sort of what you talked about will ties into a little bit of what Tracy had talked about, how you work, your goal is to work with media, you know, you, media's there, they're talking to the scientists. How can folks in the media tell better stories? How can they help, how can they help people understand really the significance of some of the stuff? I, I think that sometimes com science communications, we've often, it, at least in this country and a lot of times just expect to give people information and that they will just believe it. And I think journalists know that that's not the case. And I know scientists know that's not necessarily the case. What can journalists do to do their jobs, make your life a little bit easier for yeah, your research? I mean, and this is going to sound kind of odd, but what's actually hurt us more is some of the sensationalism that journalists sometimes create about the disaster story. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm shocked that every time CNN reports on a hurricane, they're like, life-threatening storm surge, the biggest hurricane. No, we just saw this last year, same thing. So sometimes the sensationalism numbs the public mm -hmm. and actually can hurt us in, in working contrary to creating a sense of urgency. So I think what I, I've actually never had a journalist that interviewed me say, what kind of message do we need to actually get out that will be of the best service to society? Yeah. They've never asked me that. And, and I would say then, I would say, no, I wouldn't sensationalize this. I would also, you know, our research has shown that these kind of messages are landing well, so let's emphasize that part of the narrative. So when you think about disaster response, just as an FYI, if you tell somebody, you know, you have to invest all this money up front to avoid the future hurricane that might come, we don't know when, years from now, public won't act because there's no guaranteed return. Mm -hmm. But that's the headline that's dramatic, right, is talking about the next big hurricane. It's helping me deliver the punchline that if you do this while well, it'll make you safe for the next hurricane, it'll raise your house value tomorrow. It'll actually make your kids safer and more secure. And these aren't sexy headlines, but they're the actual headlines that save lives. So I would love a journalist to work with me to tell those hidden benefits of our story rather than what's sensational on CNN, like, um, because sometimes, again, that numbs the public. Um, it, it sensitizes them in a way that's actually not productive to driving change. And I see media as a key instrument in driving change because politically we actually can't do it. Mm -hmm. We will not have reforms in our policies as a country in time to save lives. So if we don't find other ways to get the message out, and I'm truly hoping that comes through allies in journalism, as well as we're trying to shape the way we talk about real estate, another form of communication, but what we message as being important in our communities and our homes, um, are gonna be two key messages that will drive change well before our politicians will mandate change. So I actually really need help in getting that story out in a less sensational but urgent way. Yeah, I almost feel like to get people to tune in, they need the- They do, the, the, that's the, what I said, it's the, a conundrum, right? The person to stand there yeah. in, the, in the middle of the hurricane. And I always feel like, leave, what are you doing there? You know, with their hair <laughs> blowing and oh, their Oh no, jacket. yeah, the guy has like got stuff flying it, past his head. I know, and, like, and there's stuff flying that? and you know. But isn't there a sensationalism to that too, right? That's that what Joe it is. San, Jim Santori, right? He's standing there with the goggles on and getting plastered by a gale and like there's something awesome to say you were there on the front lines. Right. Day, right, and I think that sometimes people will only leave if Jim Cantori comes. They're yes. like, oh no, like, it's time to go. Jim's here, Jim it's is time to leave. Goggles. So maybe yeah, in that so way, maybe he's time done something. to go. But yeah, I, I think the takeaway though truly is um, knowing what we both need, right? In the same yeah. way that we have to know what the policymaker needs, what the funder needs. Um, in my media allies, what do we need to actually have, again, this science serve society best and how can we work together to get that message out? I think that could be a great opportunity. I'll uh, ask one more question and then I'll bring it to the audience for your questions. But uh, Sandeep, you, you're a generalist. You talked about how you, know, you, you had a certain area of expertise. When you are writing a story about something that you don't know as much about, describe that process mm -hmm. for us and, and describe then how you're able to get that out in an understandable way for people who are going to read it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same probably as for all of us. It's, it's, the thing I like about it is it's a constant learning process. You know, it's uh, really fun to dive into something completely fresh and, you know, say, oh, I need to learn every, everything I need to know about the story, you know, before my deadline. And so um, I'll start off by, you know, just 
reading a lot of scientific articles about the topic. I'll um, obviously, you know, I think it's hugely important to actually talk to the people doing the science. So I will reach out to as many people as I can who are doing the science and talk to them. And that's really, you know, the best way. I mean, you, you can tell sort of a basic idea from the you know, from what's published, but you really need to talk to people to, to really understand what's going on with the science, what, you know, what is, what is their takeaway, get other people to sort of, you know, talk about, like, what is significant here, what, do you, you know, <laughs> what, what are the controversies, what is settled science, what is, uh, and so th th I really, it's this combination of doing the research um, and, you know, just a lot of interviews, and that's how I kind of get a guy, you know, basically for each topic that I'm writing about, I become like, you know, just sort of an expert on that topic for <laughs> while I'm writing that story. Yeah, and you, you said something to my class today that I thought was really interesting. So for anyone who reads uh, mainstream media, and I've had a lot of folks in the past think, oh, well, I only saw one person quoted in that article, or I only saw two, two or three people in that article, or that reporter just went in with a certain opinion, mm -hmm. and they quoted these people that they knew would back up their opinion, and that's who's in there. So tell us how many people you interview for a feature. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, easily 15 to 20 people, I think, for every um, sort of feature story. I mean, bare yeah. minimum would be like eight to 10. Obviously, it's determ determined a bit by the deadline, but but fundamentally, I mean, I talk to as many people as I can squeeze in before my deadline, and and the idea is just to get it right, you know, to, yeah. to really sort of, you know, get the science. I mean, I'm not I'm not the scientist. I just want to be able to convey that science as accurately as possible, and then my job is to make it understandable to you know the general public, yeah. and and the other thing you know which I mentioned to your class is that. You know, that doesn't mean that I'll quote 15 to 20 people <laughs> in that article. I mean, the, the articles would just be quotes, I think. So, um, you know, a lot of that information is, is sort of, you know, background information helps me write the story. But, um, yeah, I pick sort of, you know, the best quotes and, the, you know, whatever helps me tell the story in the best way possible from, from all that interviewing. Right. I, I just think that's something that a lot of people don't know. So that's why I wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, I'd like to open it up to those of you in the audience uh, for your questions, and then I'll have one more wrap-up question uh, that any and all of you could answer if you'd like. So who would like to go? Yes. I have an oh, let me, can I? I'm wondering if I can carry. Oh, okay, I'll go get that. I'll be right with you. It seems to me that so many times we turn to the scientists as the supreme knowledgeable people that really know what's going, to, what's going on and really what's happening. And as I look at so many of these things, um, take for example our handling of COVID, where we supposedly knew what it was and how to treat it, and in hindsight, that turns out to be not right. We hear so much about the impact of, of uh, on the environment and the the weather result, etc. And then, most recently, we hear that there were 1,600 uh, scientists, including two Nobel Prize winners, that took exception with all that has been reported to date on the causes and the effects of, of uh, environmental problems. Makes me wonder, do we really know? And if we don't know, if it, if it was just a best opinion, wouldn't it be better that we share knowledge that nobody knows for sure, but we're just trying to do our best? I can try take another story where, you know, we talked about uh, the uh, the solution uh, for using electricity as opposed to fossil fuels. 
And, and one of the well-known speakers here on this campus about a year ago was talking about uh, uh, the, the battery uh, solution. And I said, or the, the windmill solution. And I said, but has anybody thought the next step forward? What's the result of your solutions? Does anybody even think about the result of the solutions that's being proposed or mandated? Worse yet, <laughs> man mandated. And the answer is no. We just have to guess. Well, then let's, let's lay it on the line. Let's talk about what we know and what we don't know, what we're assuming, what we're guessing, and communicate those kind of ideas rather than false narratives. Thank you. Did you have a question that you wanted yes, sir, someone yeah. to respond, or? Yeah, well, I, I'm just, am I off in my thinking, or is this really the situation? Okay. So what, I, what I will say, especially as I work in communities that are affected by disaster, I wish I were God. I wish I would have infinite wisdom to the past, the present, the future, and infinite wisdom across disciplines to know the answer. None of us know. And I would have two choices in life. Choice number one, I forestall until I know the answer. My life will end, I'll never know the answer. Or I could do my best today to save a life within the limits of what I know, to, as we call it, engineering judgment. I take an oath as an engineer, equivalent to a medical doctor, to do no harm. But it doesn't make me infallible. I have to operate on the best evidence I have today. And it evolves. With the next hurricane, what I thought I knew in Katrina has completely changed in Ian, will change again this hurricane season. And so our world is infinitely complex and known only candidly, in my belief, by God, and I'm a human. So I think we try to do our best. I won't apologize for people who use science maliciously, but I will say that the scientists that I'm a part of, the community I'm a part of, we ethically do our very best with the knowledge we have today to try to make this world better with the full commitment to keep learning. And that might mean updating what we know tomorrow as our science evolves, our technology evolves, as our dialogue evolves globally and we learn more. But our knowledge is like ever expanding. And I think it's challenging dilemma we face as communicators, and maybe they can join me in, in commenting on the second part of your question. If we only could report what we know for certainty, we actually would have probably blackness in terms of the knowledge we share because nothing I think is known with 100% certainty. And if we communicate with a ton of caveats, then people may not listen at all. And I don't know the right balance between objectivity and honesty and over you know, apologizing that we don't know everything and people saying, oh, well then I'm not gonna listen at all. And then lives are lost because of complacency. I don't know that balance, it's, it's difficult. But I appreciate your sensitivity to how many times the message changes, especially with a rapidly evolving situation like COVID or other rapidly evolving crises on our planet. I'm with you, it's frustrating. From our side, we are trying to do our very best with the limited human abilities we have, and we stay up day and night to do better, and that's what we pledge our lives to do. If I could just comment on that. Yeah. I'll leave it to my communicators about how we communicate uncertainty, because I think that's a challenge. I face that in yeah. communities. I can't say for certain where the water's coming next. I can give you error bars. <laughs> and I found that the everyday human doesn't understand the error bars, and then I struggle. So maybe my communicators can help me, my, my journalists and other you know, science communicators, <laughs> if you can. Because I mean, I can just give you the error bars. Mm -hmm. How they communicate that in a way that doesn't erode your confidence and protects you is really tricky. I don't know if you guys have thoughts. I'm just thinking of the everyday media, and you know, here I am, I'm one of three and a half reporters at the <laughs> newspaper. And, but, but granted, there's national uh, reporters out there too, but so we have to deal with the resources that we have. But as well, there's a lot of information coming here, and, and we can only get what we get from the science community. So that all has to be held in balance. With, in other words, in a situation like the, the pandemic, you're dealing with a firestorm of information and, and dealing with it at a fast pace. 
So um, keeping that in balance, if, if there are perspectives, I mean, yeah, you need to listen to what all those perspectives mm -hmm. are in a critical way. Um, our, you know, as journalists, as a dyed-in-the-wool journalist, you know, you're there to provide a, a balanced story. Um, we're not pulling one way or another, but, um, yeah. But yeah. How do you guys approach when the science thinks it knows this is what we know today? Mm -hmm. Would you ever write that as a headline? Like, today we, this is what we know today could change tomorrow? Or how would you caveat the fact that anything we know is conditional? Mm -hmm. On what kind of our understanding today and tomorrow, it could completely change as we learn more. It has to do with who is the source. So we, so attri we, attribute, we, we attribute according to so-and-so who is a da-da-da-da. Yeah. Da, da. So I mean, you, you try to make clear when you're talking to that source. Um, so what, you know, what's, what's your degree of certainty or whatever? Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you're clear on what that person is saying and then you attribute it. It's not for me to decide, oh, this is it, you know? And that comes in the, in the wording of things, which is, you know, I'm a very appreciative of nuanced reporting and being sure that you get how you write things, especially when you're writing things very quickly. It's, it's if the more you understand a topic, if, if you now if you're a reporter who's just thrown into the milieu and you're like, here, cover this, you're like, oh, okay, it, that's difficult, but um, it helps to j just to be able to to securely know between source and reporter what do you know and, and to what degree give, give it to me, you know, be honest with me. Let's be on an honest. I think you know. one of the tricky parts is sometimes if you read the. A lot of times people won't read the whole story and that the journalists will try their very best to add the nuance, to add the quotes from the scientists that they're quoting, to even include that uncertainty in the article. But then the headline that they're, the reporters don't generally write the headlines or they can give a suggestion, but depending on where, it, if it's in print, depending on where it is on the page or depending if what kind of publication you work for, you could be as nuanced as you want, and then that headline comes out to something that it, it looks black and white. And I think that's a problem. And I don't know if you've, have you ever had a headline that you wrote a story and you were careful, 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 and you looked at the headline and you said, oh my goodness, someone's oh, I mean, gonna be mad at me. Absolutely, it, it happens all the time, <laughs> you know, and, and it, you know, part of that is because it's, one, it's hard to convey uncertainty, Two headline writers don't like conveying uncertainty, right? Like, <laughs> so it's it's this it's sort of iterative process where you talk to the scientists, and you know, no scientist as you know, every scientist is going to give you a whole bunch of caveats. Hand waving. Uh, yeah, and and yes. that uh, you know that is sort of, uh, uh, and then I take that and I try to sort of convey those caveats in a way that's nuanced, but also doesn't completely make it seem like oh, this is meaningless, <laughs> um, and then. And then the headline writer takes that and kind of usually has a flat statement <laughs> that you know takes all of that nuance out usually. Uh, and so it's it's yeah I think part of it is the way that the, you go from the science to the science communication to you know especially like sort of the more buzzy headline <laughs> writing mm -hmm. places. It's uh, some, yeah, and I can think it, of it. It is a, a problem. A few <laughs> offhand, and then I think that maybe in, in yo our younger grades, younger ages, that we're not good enough at telling people from a young age who are not scientists mm -hmm. that science changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Science is not static. Yeah. Yeah. Science is always developing. You know, you may know something today and then in 20 years, I'm sure you've probably read a lot of headlines that said, eggs are great, eat mm -hmm. eggs. Eggs are bad, you're gonna die of cholesterol, your you know, arteries are gonna be hard. Oh, and then tomorrow, oh, eat an egg a day. So, I, and, and I think all of those things were probably true in some study or another, but if, I think maybe we don't do a good enough job just nationally with saying, hey, science changes, or you know, kind of getting that message across, it could help too. I'll give you this pack. Yeah. As I said, I wanted to not leave this subject on a negative point. Uh, and to make it positive, I wanted to again give a claim to Ed Young, 
uh, who is a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winning author. And he basically said, hey, don't look to the scientists as, as the know-it-all. And use much more empathy as you're communicating. <laughs> Well, I'll just add too, because like, I think that you know the nuance and the informed consumer of science is important. So what you're trying to do when you're writing is make an informed reader, right? And so you're making decisions, you're having critical thinking while you're reading this too. And it's not just the science changes, but not all evidence is created equal. So being that informed consumer and understanding, okay, this is one study with a sample size of 10 is very different than a meta-analysis that's taking 500 studies that are all coming to the same conclusion. Which one are you gonna put more stock into? And so not only training people to understand, hey, science is changing, but not all evidence is equal. And you know, you said our young people, I think about it with our policymakers. I'm talking about it all the time. This is a good study, this isn't. This is a randomized control trial that has a control group and a treatment group, and we can have causal evidence that something works yeah. versus a correlational study. Mm -hmm. And understanding those basics is really important to being an informed consumer of whatever you read. And that is a lot of what I do in science communication yeah. on the Hill too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would only add one thing, which is we sometimes talk about the scientific community, but I would say we have multiple scientific yeah. communities. And you can look at the social psychology of some of those communities and see who trained whom and who's related and who grew up in the same neighborhood and who has what theories in their dissertations or who's disconfirming certain theories in their dissertations and kind of build a story around why certain groups have certain things in their scientific proceedings or certain policy recommendations. So, that was the only thing I would say is that we, I don't think we have one scientific community. We don't all do science in the same way. We, like Jill pointed out, we don't all have the same evidence. And maybe I'd be like, oh, random control trial. What about when this happened to this one person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's what I would say there. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, to your point, I think if more people also sort of, if we got across to more people that science is a process, not sort of this, uh, you know, one body of knowledge that you can constantly draw on, I think would be, it would be really helpful in terms of science communication. And I mean, fundamentally, I think, you know, scientists are imperfect and science communicators are imperfect because we're all human and humans are imperfect. <laughs> but we're, at least most of us are trying to do our best uh, under often difficult circumstances. So. Right. And deadlines, right? And yes. Deadlines. <laughs> yeah. yep. But I think that's a key yeah. factor, the time factor. Yes. Yes. In the same Absolutely. way that if I don't make a recommendation before the next hurricane season, lives could be lost. I'm sure mm -hmm. you have a deadline that I either get some information mm -hmm. out and I try to make it credible and ethical. Mm -hmm. But if I don't hit the deadline, no information gets out, right? Mm -hmm. And we're in a darkness, right? We've Absolutely. shared nothing in that moment. Mm -hmm. and that's this tension that time mm -hmm. and a flood of information creates for all of us. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm swimming in it and you are as mm -hmm. well. Uh, next question. Uh, it kind of goes, well, it yeah. goes through the, uh, just throw it, see if you can catch it. <laughs> you do not want me throwing anything. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Let's throw the next thing. So uh, you kind of talked about the time pressure that comes with deadlines. And the nature of journalism is often making mistakes and having to go back and kind of clean up after yourself. Um, so. How do you, each of you, kind of approach um, dealing with negative feedback from readers or anyone else reviewing your work or reading your work and giving you comments or emails and stuff like that? How do you kind of sort through those and work through those and uh, try to answer them and improve your pieces afterwards? Thank you. Thank you. Part of my role is to look at feedback from these federal agencies that we've asked for money from. And oftentimes, a program officer at that agency will have convened a review panel, and the reviewers will use either some metrics or some open-ended questions. And typically, a program officer would soften them a bit before they send them up. <laughs> it's interesting when that doesn't happen because then you think, oh, well, this program officer is under a lot of pressure too. They're, Jill and I were talking mm -hmm. about a situation earlier this week. Um, they're just trying to crank something out, and that's maybe why this word came out. So typically when we get feedback from that federal agency, 
we use that feedback to improve a next round. However, there's not necessarily the same solicitation out next time. Or maybe the faculty member or the research team wants to go for a different agency. They're like, they don't get what we're going for, but this one does. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of using what you can to try to improve it. Sometimes it can be harsh, and sometimes people don't want to accept it. And they'll just say, I'm misunderstood. Maybe you are misunderstood, but you also missed a chance to do better. So we use it a lot, and we also try to talk people off the ledge sometimes, too, <laughs> after some harsh feedback has come their way. So. I don't know if anyone has a, any formal response you've had to <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think I've had to do formal responses. I will get sort of emails from readers every once in a while. Uh, and I always appreciate the fact that they've taken the time to write to me, uh, you know, and uh, it's always, uh, so as long as it's constructive criticism or, um, you know, pointing out factual inaccuracies, I mean, I, you know, always thank them for, for their feedback and I, you know, try to learn from it. I mean, it's, um, you know, like, like I said, <laughs> given the, the, the deadlines and the, you know, we're doing our best, but, you know, everyone makes mistakes, mistakes will be made, and so I just try to, um, sort of learn from those and try to make sure I don't, um, you know, make the same mistakes next time. You know, try to focus on different mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> but at the newspaper, I mean, if, if someone points out a mistake, we're on it right away to, we'll write a correction. So page A2 yeah. in the newspaper, that's where you put corrections on, and online, you go immediately online and, and fix it right away. And that's always a low feeling for a journalist because, like, you know, you're going to get, the, there's a thousand variables in a story, every letter, every word, everything, but you're going to fix it because that's what we're, you know, that's our code of ethics too, that's, that's what we live up to, that's our level of trust with our readers. We just put trust in us. Our sources put trust in us too. We have sources sometimes that we don't name, so trust is a huge thing in, in getting things accurate. And also, if somebody just has a difference, you know, I, I respond to everybody who, who reaches out basically as long as I can see it's a legit e email. I just, yeah, respectfully respond and thank you for, you know, and sometimes I have a little something to, to respond, but I, I learned customer service a long time ago at the grocery <laughs> store at <laughs> Martin supermarket where you got your, uh, <laughs> so. Okay. But, but the key is take 24 hours when you need it before responding. That was a lesson I learned with my advisor who did fire off at an editorial board and he thought he was replying to me and instead he replied all to the editorial board. Oh. And use some very colorful language to describe the editor's, you know, position on this particular article. So that is a rule I teach my students. If that comes back hot, take 24 hours. You could, you could draft your response, don't send it. Mm -hmm. And take time to chill out and process it carefully because emotions can be damaging, mm -hmm. especially in a profession when you're interfacing mm -hmm. um, with the public or, or with bodies like an editorial body. And, and that was one we did get in trouble on when we were too fast and too hot. <laughs> so 24 well, hours is your rule. One of our, our former columnists, David Ha, he, he yeah, writes for the, Cop, the Chicago yeah. Tribune, right? He said, we had editor, sports editor at the South Bend Tribune, Bill Bolinsky got this really harsh letter to him about a story, and he wrote, oh, it was a really good response, and he brought it to the editor, he says, here's what you're gonna do with this. You're gonna frame it, you're gonna put it on the wall, <laughs> wall. and Dude, you're not gonna it. send it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes people are right, and sometimes they're, they just need to get something off their chest. Yeah. I had this one time when I had written an article about a refugee family, and I did not, um, did not name them for purposes of, we, we were given their, their names by Catholic Charities, I believe, of the refugee family. And my editors knew who they were, and you know, in this case, we decided not to use their names because they were very worried. I got this, uh, about a week later, I got a letter in the mail, you know, like a mm. card, and I opened it up and I thought, oh, it's a card. And on the card, in the front, there was a puppy and a kitty cat <laughs> and like little flowers. And inside that card, that person just ripped me apart. How dare I write this article about this refugee family? This dictator is gonna find them. And oh, I mean, geez. they didn't leave any information, but I left that in my drawer, because sometimes we're our harshest critics. Yeah. I don't know why, I should have just torn it up, but. <laughs> I, I think it made it worse by the puppy and the kitten on the front because it just yeah. did not track with what was inside of that note. No. <laughs> we are our harshest critics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you have to kind of get over your mistakes mm -hmm. and move on and not and think about some of the better responses that you get, <laughs> I think. 
Um, does anyone have one more question? And then I'll ask a final question to any, all of you. So how would you define success? Do you have either a quick example of something that you felt really good about that you did? Or do you have sort of a more general example of, on a daily basis, how do you define your own success? I wouldn't say this is my definition, but it's one held across the unit I work for, which is, has our research funding gone up? And how have we contributed to that? If I think about smaller projects, one way I would think about success is, were we able to connect people together to work on something to make it better? I know that seems very simple, but it means that people were willing to listen and communicate with each other and take steps to make something better than where you started. And then a really great success is, oh, somebody that we worked with learned something new is gonna use it again to make it better without getting the critique to make it better already, you know, that sort of thing. So it kind of builds. That makes sense. Uh, I guess there's, on a, on a personal level, I think, um, you know, I, I sort of consider myself a success if I'm constantly learning, that's what I, I enjoy most about sort of, you know, uh, have always enjoyed most. And so I've being able to, you know, be in a field where I'm constantly learning new things is, I think, um, is, is sort of would be my personal definition of success. But in terms of the work I do, I think if I've made people learn something that they didn't know, know before, uh, you know, that's, that, it sort of brings me sort of satisfaction. I find that rewarding, and so I, that's what I'm aiming to do with each of my articles. Yeah, in journalism and with writing, they say, hey, if nobody reads it, then it, you know, what, what good is it? So it doesn't su succeed, so the idea is that you read, get people to read things, and you always want, there's their, when you're a writer, there's a bit of neurotic, uh, you know, tendency, but, um, <laughs> because you're always thinking, of, you, know, you want people to read this. Um, and, and there's things that you put all this time and energy into, it's a big project, and it gets published, and you're like, did, did you get any responses? <laughs> no, no, not really. And then you write two paragraphs that get posted to the internet, and it's, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's about something that, that people just latch onto, and that's the internet. Um, but, it, and there's a lot of that, and that's and, and that's the media, and that's a big part of what we're talking about here too, with headlines and and there's SEO searches and all that. It's a, it's a lot of that talk. There's a lot of energy going in that way. Um, so that's something to note or to, to be aware of. But um, and, and so it's it's moving things in a certain way with the internet. It's like what do what are people going to click on? And that's a big. You know, for me, I'm an old school journalist, so if, if it's all just clickbait, you know, how does that compare with just good old fashioned journalism that's nuanced and balanced and, and deep and meaningful? But that said, you know, I, it's great when I, I write something that people respond to a lot, like the Crow's story. I, a lot of people latched on to that, of course. You know, I'm outside of my nature writing. There's, I've written, there was a, a homeless fella that I wrote about who passed away, and it just was able to get into to his life and kind of showed more depth than just this homeless guy. Oh, he was a daughter, and he was at his daughter's wedding, and then he died falling on the sleep Christmas Eve. Um, so there was a lot of more context to it. Um, and, and the responses I, I got, there were a couple of people that I know, they were like, oh, I have a brother who, who's you know, homeless. And I, said, I didn't realize that about the, these people. And so when you get this, to the heart connection and, and that sort of response from people. I think that's, yeah. you're hitting home. So it, when I think about sort of communicating with policymakers, I think there's several levels to where you think like success and outcome. Sometimes it's just making them aware that we've got this expertise, right? And that this is important, this is an important topic. 
then sort of the next level, I think, is then they understand and they call on our faculty for that expertise, that, that they can weigh in on certain conversations. And then really sort of the ultimate is that it impacts legislation, right? Um, and we've had a, a recent example that I think of. I work closely with the Lab for Economic Opportunities, which is a group of economists on campus that really look at rigorous evidence behind poverty fighting solutions. And they had a whole body of work, so several studies that were you know, very rigorous and sort of had causal evidence around job training programs to be able to get people into living wage careers. So they had a brief on it, it was nice two pages, had some really you know, nice conclusions. We sent it around to people on the Hill. That came back from one of our senators said, hey, we would like one of their experts to come testify at a hearing. And that's sort of ultimately, that's great. That gets Leo's work out and it's a great way for a body of policymakers to hear about it. And then sort of next steps, that hearing was to think about legislation and Leo got to weigh in on some of the nuances of what was written into that piece of legislation. I think that's a real, nice story if we want to look at outcomes for sort of pushing some of our expertise and what we know and our science and our expertise that's kind of a nice illustration i think of the way it could work yeah um i think for me ultimately this kind of search for truth that start out with that really great question i mean that's what i'm pursuing every day and i so i, I think success for me is helping Families and decision makers across this country have grown in their knowledge today. And maybe they're going to grow more tomorrow and even the next day. But the fact that today they know more than they did yesterday about the actions they could be taking, in my case, to literally protect their communities um, from the next disaster means a lot to me. And so I, I'm one of the academics who'll tell you that the rigorous studies are great, but if they don't make that translation to a kitchen table conversation, about what we're doing in our family and how we're going to prepare next and how we're going to you know, get ourselves ready for the next challenge in front of me, then I really don't think we've done our job as, as scientists and, and, in my case, as engineers. So I guess it's the day that at a kitchen table a family is empowered and has the knowledge and information necessary to move forward with confidence that they can keep their family safe. Well, thank you all today for uh, you know, meeting on our panel. I appreciate it. I wanted to thank the College of Science the Glenn Family Honors Program and the Journalism, Ethics, and Democracy Program for helping sponsor this event. And thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. thank you.